Obviously, there are wars going on throughout the world. Uh, there are in conflicts going on throughout the world. And the Hebrew calendar tells us that this is a season of rest. But there are other facets of the Hebrew calendar that are also relative to what is going on in our world. You know, the Hebrew calendar is considered the most accurate calendar ever created, uh, of course, centuries and centuries ago. It was created based on a timeline established by God. Hello, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, my family. I'm going to talk about prophecy as it relates to the Hebrew calendar. Now, I have my glasses on, my Clark Kent look here, because I'm going to be diving into the weeds a little bit, because prophecy is predicated largely on the Hebrew calendar. That is something that we need to understand in order to understand prophecy as it relates to our world today. You know, the Hebrew calendar is considered the most accurate calendar ever created. Uh, of course, centuries and centuries ago, it was created based on a timeline established by God, and it was used as a demarcation for prophecy even to this day. So I'm going to be going over some of those prophetic markers as they relate to the Bible as it speaks to us today and is what, what is happening relative to our world and what we can expect and why we are experiencing some of the events uh, that are going on within the world uh, today. Okay, it was a, a, the, the Hebrew calendar really is the Hebrew calendar that was established by virtue of a period of time that predicated some of the Hebrew celebrations, the Jewish celebrations that are practiced today, Hanukkah uh, and so forth. The Hebrew calendar, however, is specific to each year and the months in each year. So I'm going to be talking about the 10th month of the Hebrew calendar which is known as the Tevet. Uh, it's the begin, it began December 13th. Um, so when I say began, you'll be watching this perhaps before December 13th, but that's when the Tevet calendar begins. What is specific about this period of time on the Hebrew calendar? Uh, it is associated with the number 10 and 10 is the number associated associated with godly order authority and the testimony and scales of justice a season of rest essentially so we are in that he, that season of rest according to the hebrew calendar now why why is this important or relevant to what's been going on in our world well Obviously, there are wars going on throughout the world. Uh, there are conflicts going on throughout the world. But in the United States of America, there's been an election that has been transpired that has caused a great deal of con uh, contention, uh, division in some cases, and anxiety. Anxiety because we had two candidates for president in the United States who were diametrically opposed. You probably couldn't get more opposite candidates than were Donald Trump and, and Kamala Harris in the election. And each side was very entrenched in terms of what their beliefs were. Of course, the side that I always err on is the side of life. Uh, God's creation of life. However, my point being is that we are in need of a season of rest, regardless of which side you are in. And the Hebrew calendar tells us that this is a season of rest, but there are other facets of the Hebrew calendar that are also relative to what is going on in our world 
that are not restful entirely in nature. And I'll get to that in a moment because this is very important, this message. I've got to say that when I give a message that is prophetic according to biblical prophecy and the Hebrew calendar as it sets demarcations for prophecy, these are important because we need to understand what God is speaking to us from the ancient of days, knowing full well in the ancient of days, what would happen today? That is the, that is God's mindset. He knew thousands of years ago, what would happen today? Isn't that mind blowing? You know, when I had my experience in heaven, I understood this. The Bible talks about a thousand days as a year and vice versa. Time is irrelevant in the Bible and God has trended out the timeline that he established in the Hebrew calendar for us to understand what is going on today and what will go on uh, in the future uh, for us, because he wants us to be well aware of what's going on so we can act accordingly. All right. I want to thank, um, before we get in too much into this, I want to thank our friend Stacy Mueller of Momana. We're going to show you a link to her ministry. She funds many Christian ministries throughout the world, but she is our Hebrew by uh, Hebrew calendar expert. I have not met anyone or known of anyone uh, in the public domain who is as expert as, as Stacy Mueller. We've had her on our program before when she's spoken about the Hebrew calendar, she studies it all of the time and the, the markers that are in the Hebrew calendar. Okay. Stacy informed us that, and she measures these things and then she keeps us aware of these. We'll have her on the program at some point in the not too distant future. But she said that the next three months are suited to spend time, quote unquote, resting with the father digging into his word and prayer. So we're to use this time to dig into God's word, prayer, worship, and devotion to God. This is our time of rest, not just to go on vacation, but to dive into God's word, to pray, to have a conversation with the Lord and to worship him with our words and uh, with our, with our song. All right, the season lends itself to intimacy and renewed strength and to clarity to understand God's direction ahead. So this is a time of preparation. The election in the U.S. is over. Now is a time to dive deep into God. God has, has established his leader for the United States of America and also one that will help to lead throughout the world in different facets because the United States of America is the leader of the quote unquote free world. So that's very important as it relates to events in the Middle East, as it relates to what happens in the war in, in Ukraine, as it relates to what's happening in China and Asia and Latin America and throughout the world. So the month that we're talking about now of this Hebrew calendar period of time is associated with the tribe of Daniel. Uh, the tribe of Daniel is relative to what we're going to be talking about in this space of uh, time as, as ordained and also established by God. Daniel was one of the tribes that formed the branch on the northern side of the tabernacle, along with Asher and Nef, uh, Naphtali. Um, now, these tribes that Daniel was ahead of uh, were known as the rear guard. I'm going to get to why that's very significant as it relates to what we need to know for today. He was over what was called at those at that time, the rear guard. And he chose to protect the tribes at that time, the Jewish tribes, obviously from the enemies coming from behind through the back door. And that's a quote unquote back door as well as it relates to numbers 
chapter 10, verse 25. Now, Daniel in particular has the gift uh, at that time uh, to catch the enemy, quote unquote, as it relates to the Bible and what it states, off guard. So he was able to determine how to catch the enemy off guard. Now understand that throughout the time of the Old Testament, the Jewish people were being uh, under, a, they were under attack as, as they are today even. So Daniel had this gifting from the Lord to look at the back door that is where the enemy was trying to enter in. And this relates to what I'm going to be telling you about in that the enemy is trying to enter in through the back door as it relates to today. Uh, and he was, Daniel, that is, able to use discernment, clever discernment as it relates to what the Bible tells us in gaining the victory over the enemy. Because, you know, uh, the enemy, that is spiritual powers, principalities, spirits of darkness, demons, um, and, and those that, who are affected by the demons, in other words, they're hearing the voice of, of the demonic and they're executing that, the will of, of Satan and his minions, um, the, uh, that enemy, which influences people uh, in, our, in our time today, uh, often catches us through the back door. We've seen how that has happened uh, relative to some backdoor strategies. We've seen the enemy has caught us off guard in the back door. How's he done this? He's influenced various circles. He's influenced, influenced education. That's a backdoor way of influencing our children, influencing our young adults at universities, uh, influencing also media uh, circles. So uh, all of this kind of cropped up and came to the forefront in this election as we saw that these very insti these institutions were representative not of godly values necessarily, some obviously were, but ones that were antithetical to the way of Jesus Christ, the way of God. Um, we saw it in terms of how they presented themselves in terms of having to identify people by virtue of their ethnicity, their racial lines and things and their, their gender or transgender uh, as, as it was spoken of in, in a normalized kind of way. We saw how this was being presented as the means by which we would view people. Of course, God doesn't view people by virtue of how much um, melanin they have in their skin or our features. You know, that God doesn't see us that way, and we should not see ourselves in that way, but that's how it was being portrayed, uh, even those of their um, affections. And that's how we should see people, and that's what should be most pronounced about them. No, God sees the heart. And so, but these other institutions are backdooring how, how they wanted us to see God's people, how, how they wanted us to, to view people. And what does that do? That backdoor strategy then lended itself to think in terms of how we can best represent people according to the worldly ways apart from God. So um, one would be the stance on life. Uh, of course, that was seen as, as quote unquote, health care uh, amongst those backdoor uh, outlets uh, in society. Uh, and health care has nothing to do with taking the life of the unborn. So that's how, how media, universities, education, uh, we're trying to redefine uh, how we should view God's greatest creation of humankind. Okay, now let's go back to the Bible now as it relates to today. And I'm going to be telling you about some events that are going to be happening that you need to be very aware of. You need to be as wise as, uh, uh, <laughs> as, as 
wise as doves and uh, innocent as sheep and wise as well, doves, uh, wolves, excuse my ruining that, but uh, for some reason I had a brain block on that. Okay, you know what I mean. All right, now the Pharisees are the New Testament example, my family, of the uncircumcised, and I think you know what that means. It was very prevalent, of course, in, in Old Testament practices. The Pharisees were the are the New Testament example of the uncircumcised authority motivated by the need for power and control. What does that mean? It means that the Pharisees, instead of being beholden to God and God's ways, they were looking for power and control. You see, with any entity, whether it describes to being, uh, you know, Christian or non-Christian, that seeks power and control that is not keeping God foremost is going to pervert, pervert, pervert what is of God. Okay. Now the doctrines of men, quote unquote, created and imposed, uh, by the standards of that day in the time of the Pharisees made way for a holy quote, I'm using that quote unquote, I'm using a lot of quote unquotes, holy quote unquote, enslavement system, system now, purpose to keep the people under their rulership. So that's what, that's what the Pharisees were trying to do. They weren't trying to grow people closer to God. They were trying to enslave them into a system whereby they would control the system, the Pharisees, the pharisaical leaders of that day. Okay, I'm getting to something here. Very, very important. Please, 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 please stay with me. Now, this legalism made the way for these quote-unquote judges to become bullies and tyrants and convince uh, the society at that time to crucify Jesus on the cross. Now today, and here's where it relates to where we live in this time, in this era. Today, we see this same pharisaical spirit trying to rob people of the truth, of their peace, and of God's true righteousness. That is going on today. It's happening in some circles, not only in, in various media outlets and, and also uh, institution, educational institutions. No, no, this is happening even within the church today. And there are various church leaders, if I may say, who are using and perverting God's truth to create an enslavement system we call this, by and large, the religious spirit, which deprives people of relating to God and relating to one another foremost through a religious order or systemology. I have to tell you personally that I tend to avoid isms within the Christian community. Isms relate to things like Calvinism and um, uh, not evangelism, that's one I like, but other isms in terms of theological doctrines of uh, studies that define religions or religious doctrines versus the relational aspect of God. Because all of these various institutions are trying to do what? They're trying to divorce us from having an intimate, personal relationship with God. And that's one important lesson from heaven, that if you take anything away from this, hopefully you'll take this. And that is that we need to keep our relationship with God pure so that we're listening to Him directly and not indirectly. You can have a direct relationship. You can even... You can even hear God's voice as, it, as you prophesy in your world and your environment. 
You have that ability because prophecy is, is what basically prophecy is truth telling. It's, it's telling God's will. And you should understand that personally, what God's will is for you. Um, now that, that empowers you in a very powerful way that these various institutions might try to deprive you of that power that God has established within you by virtue of you being a believer in Jesus Christ so that you have the Holy Spirit imparting truth to you, imparting truth to you. And that, that is part of what these various institutions, which are of the pharisaical nature, try to deprive you of understanding that that prompting, which you know to be good, and which is something that you believe is right, is not to be trusted. It is to be trusted, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to be tri- trusted. Okay, today there are those who are naturally gifted, like yourself, as was Samson in Judges fourteen twelve. Now I made a shift. Now didn't I? I made a shift to Samson within the Bible as it relates to what he experienced, as it relates to you and me today. Samson was consumed with what? He was consumed with selfish desires. But Samson wasn't always that way. He was a leader ordained by God. But Samson chose to disobey God's laws and statutes as he knew them to be. Why did he abandon them? We all know that he abandoned them for uh, reasons of lust, uh, for uh, desires that were of the flesh. Okay, we know that part. What we don't really realize, I think, largely, is the rest of the story, as it relates to Samson, is that he managed to have 20 years of leading Israel to help them live peacefully, and the enemies, enemies around God were vanquished, or that is, they were kept at bay by virtue of Samson's leadership. So for 20 years, for 20 years this occurred. So obviously God's enemies are going to try to vanquish, get rid of Samson, because he's leading them in a way that allows God to speak in a personal, very profound way, to everyone in that tribe of Samson. Okay, but the compromises that he made eventually led to God's judgment, as we know, and the removal of the anointing, and the key word anointing, on Samson's life. So we know people who have had an anointing, they lost that anointing, and that's what happened with Samson. So... Everyone who is considered, let's say, as a prophet or a teacher is not necessarily going to maintain that anointing because that anointing is predicated. That is an anointing from God to teach, to prophesy, to, um, you know, to share uh, in other ways. That anointing is predicated on one's faithfulness to God. And this came after Samson prayed, uh, fell prey, that is, P-R-E-Y, to Delilah, as we all know that story, you know, cutting off his hair, you know, that was, uh, his strength was his hair, uh, and, and that was something that, uh, that happened, uh, because Delilah was hired, Delilah was hired by the Philistines, and they were the enemies, obviously, of God at that time, against, uh, God's people, the Jewish people at that time, uh, and the reason why the Philistines wanted, Delilah to, to, Delilah to seduce him and to eventually take away his power was to obtain the secret of Samson's supernatural power. Now bear that in mind, to, may, to take away the secret of Samson's supernatural power because it's the secret of your power, your supernatural power, that the pharisaical spirits, the Philistines of this age are trying to take away from you. You have power through Christ that you haven't even tapped into. I know it because I, I, I've come from heaven. I've, I've shared with you stories of people who have come from heaven. And I've told you the, the, the people who have come from heaven are the prophets of today. Why? Because they've seen heaven and heaven is 
expressive of the will of God. So when they come back, those who have been to heaven are expressing the will of God to others. And, and that's why some of the Philistine, the pharisaical uh, people of today are trying to rob you of the prophecies from heaven because they want to deprive you of the power that comes from the secrets of God's kingdom, the secrets of heaven. And the secrets that you embody are the secrets that the Holy Spirit inspires you with through what is revelation. Revelation is not just teaching or understanding. Revelation is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that it, uh, it elucidates, brings to life the Word of God, brings to life what is your understanding about your world and your environment inclusive of what's going on within your community and your nation. Okay. Beloved of the Lord, Jesus Christ, Samson's story speaks loudly today. This is how it's relevant to today that we cannot just learn, lean on the grace of God to further God's kingdom cause because the grace of God is his permissive will, his permissive will. We need to understand God's perfect will as it relates to what is clearly the truth versus just allowing us kind of to, to catch uh, some grace, if you will, to go off and just do our own thing. And the church, by the way, has done that by and large. You know, the church has been very event-based. It's been very uh, largely involved in not offending <laughs> those within the church. You know, sometimes we need to be offended. I need to be offended sometimes because, you know, God, Jesus certainly in his teachings offended uh, people and their preconceptions and and uh, religious um, holdings at that time. So it's good. You know, Jesus said himself, he was not, he did not come to unify. He came to divide even households, you know, and, and that's happened today, hasn't it? Politically, that's happened today. So you may be feeling it and you want to make amends and all of that. Well, well, make amends with God first before you make amends with your family or friends post-election. You know, that's, a, that's that season we're in right now is that season of peace, of rest, to draw nearer to God, closer to God. That's what he's saying today. Today, now, is a period to draw closer to God. He's, he's, he's taking us away some, from some of the conflicts around us to say, I'm just going to be at peace. I'm going to just delve into you, Lord, because, Lord, you supersede everything else. All powers, principalities, kingdoms of this world will fade away, but you, God, will have dominion. Oh, I rest in that truth. I rest in that truth today. You, God, will have dominion over all. We need to line up, beloved of the Lord, with his truth, God's truth, and ways before the compromises over time steal our ability to exercise God's authority and leave us vulnerable to the enemy who waits until the opportune time to strike a blow. Not only did the Philistines in the time of Samson deplatform Samson as a leader, but they ripped his eyes out. They shackled him to prevent him from again, ever leading again. <clears throat> what does this have to do today? It has to do today with what's going on that the power that you have, that you have personally, is now trying to be robbed of you through a backdoor strategy of the enemy. What's your backdoor? 
Your back door, beloved of the Lord, is what you don't expect. It's what you haven't planned for. Your backdoor strategy of the enemy is to deprive you of your strength. Maybe your strength is your integrity, your personal integrity. Maybe your strength is your ability to teach. The enemy will try to pervert that. Maybe your strength is your family. And the enemy will try to destroy that family. Whatever your strength is, is what the enemy will try to deprive you are through this backdoor strategy. God is humbling his church. That's you and me, beloved. When I talk about church, that's you and me, the body of Jesus Christ. Now, now I'll get to the point if you're, if you don't, if you're not part of that body, you think the body of Christ is, I don't know, whatever your preconceptions are as I had them when I was an agnostic. I'm talking to you now, the body of Christ. He is humbling us. That's what God is doing and chastening those who have persecuted his church. Yes, that's right. Those who have persecuted his church are now have been chastened. They've been chastened not only politically, which occurred to a large extent, but he's chastening those by saying those who are he's he's those who are persecuting his church by depriving people of worship uh, I've talked about this before closing down churches and that sort of thing by uh, calling uh, Christians you know narrow-minded uh, bigoted you know so on and so forth whatever close-minded the persecutors have been chastened stop it Stop speaking against those who are standing up for righteousness. And that means that the people who stand up for righteousness, if you continue to attack them, then you are doing it at your own risk. Because God is bringing this period of peace to his church, but he's also bringing a period of judgment to others who persecute his church. And he's saying to us as a church that we need to remain humble. You see, Samson became very prideful. He was a big, strong guy. He had great hair. <laughs> he, he had it all. He had it all. Probably a good looking guy, you know. He had it all. And he lost it all. He lost it all. Because he lost his humility. He lost his humility. I often say that humility is not just a practice of trying to fake it. No, humility is coming to the realization that apart from God, I have nothing. I have nothing apart from God. God is my strength. God is my strength. And if I do anything to draw me away from God, my strength will be lost. Humility is knowing that but by for the grace of God, I would be on a destination to hell. Humility is not just self-deference. Humility is realizing that, a, that God has given me everything that is good and in and of myself, as the Bible says, my, my righteousness is as, as filthy rags, as the Bible states. Quote, unquote, Bible, filthy rags is what it calls our righteousness. Unless you think you've arrived. I haven't arrived, by the way. None of us have arrived. No. No, we are all vulnerable to the temptations of this world. What are some of the temptations of this world in terms of those who are bringing messages today? Temptations are getting more clicks, getting more views, getting more subscribers, you know, becoming more well-known, becoming uh, the go-to person to teach the truth or the word of God. 
being the guy or the gal, if you will. If that's the case, and there are, <laughs> and I pray every day, God, keep me humble. I, but for the grace of you, of you, Lord God, I am nothing without you. Nothing. I've said that this is the era of the end of the celebrity Christian. Those who are looking to be recognized versus those who are looking to bring the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ and the transformation of our lives accordingly. This month and this period of time, according to the Hebrew calendar, which I started this with, is as such. It's a time to ask God for his, quote, eyes of understanding, end of quote. I'll say that again. This is a time to look for his eyes of understanding. That's the prophecy. Now, you, you want to know prophecy, you know, who's, you know, is there going to be World War II or three? excuse me, or is there going to be, you know, what's going to happen in the Middle East and all of that? I'm giving you today something more important for your life than any of the other things that are external to you. Because God is speaking to you directly today. He's bringing you the eyes of understanding so you can judge yourself righteously in the situations around you with the help of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to relate to you now an important story. Please bear with me because I'm, I'm drawing to a close here with something very, very important. I'm going to go to Genesis uh, chapter 32 verses 24 through 28 from the New, Inter Interna New International uh, Version, which I use, I use all of the versions, by the way, uh, of the Bible. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read that to you so you can understand something, and I'm going to relate it to what I saw in heaven. Okay, when I saw this in heaven uh, that I chronologued in my book, Heaven Stormed, which you can find it there, but I'm going to relate this right now to you. I think it's very important to our understanding today. Here, here's what it says in those uh, Bible verses. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. So God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, because why? Because he had wrestled with God. I want to tell you something that I personally believe. I don't trust anyone who doesn't have a limp. As in the case of, of Jacob, renamed Israel, had a limp from his wrestling. And I don't, this, I'm going to get to you who he actually wrestled with. This may surprise you because I saw it in heaven, who he wrestled with. It wasn't, wasn't necessarily God. It wasn't. It wasn't. I'll tell you who that was that he wrestled with. Okay, I'm, I'll answer the question for you because I saw it in heaven, who he wrestled with. But here's my point. My point is that if you haven't been broken, and believe me, I've been broken, as you know, of troubles, you know, all this. I've been, most of us have been broken, Right? But that brokenness has taught us something, hasn't it? It's taught us that this life is but a mist. It's taught us that, uh, you know, what's import most important, our loved ones, God foremost. Brokenness, as with this, comes from oftentimes wrestling with God's truth. 
God, why did you allow me to go through this suffering? Why are you still allowing me to? Why did you take away my loved one? Why, Lord God, why am I not healed? All of that is wrestling with God. Wrestling with God. And we've all gone through it. All gone through it. We've all said, well, God, why? Where are you? Before I went into the hospital, that's what I did. I wrestled with God. God, you got to show up because I'd lost basically everything, everything before I went on to heaven, before I, before I, you know, I went into the hospital and before, you know, heart stopped and before I went into heaven, I was wrestling with God. But you've got a new name that God has given you. Did you know that? You have a new name in heaven. He'll tell you what it is, as he told me what my new name in heaven. Now, those of you who, had read, who have read Heaven's Storm know what that new name is. I, he, God told me I couldn't speak it, but I could write it, and I wrote it in Heaven's Storm. He gave me a new name. He, he's given you a new name. Now, notice that Jacob was renamed Israel which for, was foretelling of his leading the people eventually of Israel, which would eventually lead the people of Israel to a point of freedom, but moreover to a point of redemption through Jesus the Messiah. Are you with me? All right, here's that secret I'm going to reveal from what I saw in heaven. I saw the angel of the Lord that wrestled with Jacob in heaven. Jacob did not wrestle with the Lord himself. He wrestled with the angel of the Lord, a manifestation of God himself, before God's incarnation later in history. Yeah, it's kind of mind-blowing stuff here, but all right. The story of Jacob wrestling, the wrestling match that he had is one of the most enigmatic stories in the Bible. Who wrestled with Jacob? The text calls the man who wrestled with Jacob, quote, a man, And the incident, as I, as I described, is, uh, is described in Genesis 32. Why do I tell you this and share this with you? I saw that angel, which at first I mistook as Jesus himself at the throne. When I looked upon this angel, he was standing behind God this angel standing behind God, this angel of the Lord, and, a, and I mistook him for Jesus because he looked so much like Jesus in heaven. Now, what am I getting at here? I'm going to tie this in and we're going to wrap it up. This is very important, so please focus on what I'm about to say. The angel of the Lord, who I saw in heaven, who wrestled with Jacob, who was bringing him to the point of what? Of rawness, of brokenness before the Lord, of humility, humility. Jacob wasn't this tough guy. Jacob wasn't this guy who had it all figured out. Jacob wasn't this guy who knew it all. No, he wrestled with the Lord and he got his heavenly name from the angel of the Lord, which is Israel. That's how Jacob is referenced in heaven today is Israel. What's your name in heaven. Have you wrestled with the Lord? (sighs) 
Maybe you thought you wrestled with God, as some thought that Jacob wrestled with God. But you're wrestling against angels, both fallen and of God. You're wrestled, wrestling against what I call the whisperers, who are speaking God's truth vis-a-vis the angels of God, or, or the lies of Satan, which are the fallen angels. But you're wrestling over things in your life right now. And this is a time of peace, a time of rest for you. Because God is saying to you, stop wrestling with me. That you're going to go forward with that limp. You're going to go forward with that loss. With that lack of being completely healed. But I'm going to use it. I'm going to use you. Because I've given you a name in heaven. And that name in heaven is who you are. Stop thinking that this life is all there is. That I have a job for you to do. Don't get sucked into trying to impress other people. To being this worldly kind of person who is respected by all. Be be humble with the limp that you walk with, the brokenness. Because it reminds you that you are not of this world. You are not of this world. Stop trying to consider yourself a citizen of this world. You are a citizen of heaven. And if you're not a citizen of heaven, if you don't know, if you don't know that you know that you are going to heaven on the day that you die, you need to right now confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Say something like this, Lord God, I know Jesus, you hung on that cross for me. Because I have fallen, I have wrestled against all of the things that have caused me pain and I have sinned. Foremost, I have denied you all too often. And I have, I have fallen into the temptations of this world. I have sinned, Lord God. And even if you're a believer, pray that you've fallen. We all have. But if you're doing this for the first time, what you're doing is you're saying, Jesus, I know you put yourself on the cross, not just because you had to, but because you knew I needed you as my Lord and Savior. And I invite you now, I ask you to take possession of me in the name of Jesus Christ, that you will be Lord over everything every facet of my life, and now I'm speaking to you, church, as well, every facet of my life, I surrender to you. Lord God, I surrender to you. Possess me fully. Every part of my life that is not consecrated to you, every part of my life that is not beholden to you, now I ask you to indwell me. I ask your forgiveness in the secret places in my life where I have wrestled with you and I have chosen the way of the world. Now I ask you to possess me in that area of my life. I surrender my all. I surrender my all. I am broken. And I praise you in my brokenness. So that I may not be tempted by the ways of the world. So that I might be at peace and at rest during the season of the Hebrew calendar. Where God gives us rest. There will be a time to fight. There will be a time when we need to go to battle again, again in prayer. Just in prayer. And in and, 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 and the politics of the day. And in, in coming against the powers and principalities of this world. But now is a time of rest. Knowing who you are in Christ. That you, who your name is. 
Ask God to reveal your name in heaven to you. I believe he's going to give that to you. I pray for your healing right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you will be filled with the power of God so that you will begin speaking forth the things that you thought were just imagined, but they're actually God. Speaking forth for the, for the building up of others, for the discipling of the others, and for the salvation of the lost. And I have some great news for you, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have some super, super duper great news for you. If you are born anew, if you did that, if now you go forward, not in the powers of this world or the powers of yourself, but in the power of the Holy Spirit through you to do good works, to help those who God gives you at the grocery store, at the parking lot, wherever you go to pray for them, to give them money for food, to do all the good works that God has given you the opportunity to do. Make this a season of giving. Make this a season of giving. And you know what that will do? It will give you rest. And you need to know something. That you must, regardless of what goes on in the world and your life, you must... Be of good cheer, because if you are in Christ, heaven is in your future. Take care, and God bless.